My name is Nancy Jundy. I am the COO of Digital Film Tree, which is a post-production company in Los Angeles, California. We have the high honor and privilege of working with the filmmakers that you are going to meet today on a little show called The Umbrella Academy. You are at Bringing the Umbrella Academy Life Panel, bring, Bringing the Umbrella Academy to Life Panel today. We're gonna to talk about how all of these characters get to screen from the humbleness of a script that was meticulously crafted through to finals, which is a lot of VFX, which is predated by previs. But in the meantime, I'm gonna welcome our speakers to the stage. I'm gonna stand back here so I don't trip over them or they me. And first up, we have Digital Film Trees senior VFX artist, Carlo Vega. Carlo has been with us for about five years now, I think it is. Well done, buddy. He has been serving the needs of dozens of shows and feature films at DFT. His credits include, of course, The Umbrella Academy for Netflix, Dave for VFX. We're not gonna talk about that poo scene, even though you've done quite a work there, sir. Uh, also, NCIS Los Angeles Home Economics. Carlo is an HPA nominated and creative technologist. Uh, he also is fascinated by design workflow challenges that better his own skills as well as a client's success. Next up, Andrea Aniceto Chavez. She has been with us since 2018. She is our lead producer in the game engine. And by game engine, I mean Unreal, Unity, a plethora. We are agnostic at Digital Film Tree. She has worked on shows such as Our Flag Means Death, of course, Umbrella Academy, Ted Lasso, and a few dozen other shows that you know and love. Next up, we have senior VFX producer, or senior VFX supervisor and producer on the Umbrella Academy, Everett Burrell. He has 39 years of experience in the special effects and visual effects industry for feature films and television. Everett was the first in creature effects community to design aliens and monsters using all digital tools. His company, Optic Nerve Studios, designed and created iconic characters for Babylon 5, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, The X-Files, and after having won multiple Emmy Awards in the 90s, Everett switched gears into VFX full-time, serving as the VFX supervisor on Pan's Labyrinth, Battle Los Angeles, Prometheus, and A Good Day to Die Hard. In 2016, Everett joined up with Netflix, Steve Blackman, to create the world of Altered Carbon and three seasons of The Umbrella Academy. Next up, ladies and gentlemen, Jeff King. He is the executive producer and director of The Umbrella Academy. Some of his previous credits include Blind Spot, The Black Donnellys, White Collar, and Hand of God for Amazon. Jeff is also a New York Times best-selling comic book writer, and he shares an Eisner Award for his contribution to the anthology, Love is Love. Ladies and gentlemen, showrunner of the Umbrella Academy, he is Steve Blackman with the Umbrella Academy on its third season. He has cemented his status as a showrunner to watch under his four-year overall deal with Netflix. Steve Blackman's Irish Cowboy Productions will continue to produce and develop the series for a streaming giant. Prior to his success with the Umbrella Academy, Blackman served as writer and producer for such Emmy award-winning series as Fargo, for which he won the WGA Award for Best Adapted Long Form, Legion, Altered Carbon, Bones, and many others. Welcome, y'all. Thank you for joining me here today. No, thank you. Uh, I apologize for the flight delays and all of those things, but you guys are here. You're comfy. So, I know, Steve, you can't say thing one about season three. I respect that. I appreciate it. I won't press. Well, there is one thing I can share with these uh, fine people today, and I'm excited to announce with, up here with our friends from uh, Digital Film Tree and at South by Southwest that we are going to drop globally on June 22nd, 2022 for season three. And we're really excited Woo! about that. Hello! The first yeah. to know, you guys. Bringing it to the South by Southwest crew. Thank you. And a special shout out to the Nice brothers sitting over there front row, also producers on the Umbrella Academy. Thank you for all your help in getting us here today. Okay, so let's dig in. First things first, because again, it's the South by audience. Diversity, inclusion, representation matters. We're not gonna beat around the bush. We're looking at uh, not uh, the most diverse panel up here, but we do have you to thank for creating such diversity 
your fandom is insane. We are a tiny little post house and we get the high honor of working on previs and VFX and you guys are gonna see all of that broken down here in a minute. But this came from a graphic novel and the to see queer, trans, gay, straight, disabilities, all of these things, anxiety ridden characters and to have that kind of representation on screen that mattered to you deeply. Yeah, and you know, the original graphic novel was very much, it was all, the kids were all white kids. And um, Gerard Way, who's an amazing person, I think he looks back a decade or 12 years ago when he wrote the comics and wishes, you know, he would did it more diverse. So the minute we talked about doing the Umbrella Academy, the first thing he says, let's, let's find some diversity in these characters. And it was very important for us as producers, uh, the writers, myself, that we, we did that. So we have a really amazing team of, uh, of actors. They're proud of the diversities. Um, you know, we want our world to look like the real world. Um, you know, we have, you know, Elliot Page, he's leading the charge for, for you know, trans rights. And we, we don't shy away from any of those things. So. You didn't even shy away from race riots. You, you took on all of this. You took on so many different magical powers on top of it. Like, I think there's so many people that can, you know, identify with anxiety and what that feels like to live in a body that you're constantly trying to navigate a world and what it feels like inside of you while walking around on the outside. And that's where I'm excited to get into previs and VFX because I don't think a lot of people understand what goes into showing those kinds of things on screen. You know, you can feel something, but until you actually see it and you can identify with it, it's a whole nother story. Yeah, and you know, we did, on season two, we were doing issues about, you know, Jim Crow South in 1963, and it was, uh, you know, the summer of Black Lives Matter. So it was a very, very, um, you know, it was an intense time, and we wanted to tell honest stories, relatable human stories about that time, and not cheat in any way, even though, you know, we're technically a superhero show. We're you know a show about people, about a family. So it was important that we stay true to those events, and you know we'll continue to do so. Well, so I want to queue up a, a video on previs now. Before we dig into this, before we hit play, I want to make sure that we understand what previs means. It means to pre-visualize what filmmakers are going to actually shoot. So you don't always get a chance to, you know, commandeer Daily Plaza, for example, for two whole weeks. You don't get a chance to, you know, have actors for elongated period of times. So pre-visualization actually gives you a chance in a game engine. And what that means is the same way that you would make Fortnite and all these characters and running around a battlefield of something of that nature, you can bring in a headshot from an actor, put them onto an avatar, animate them, rig them, texturize them. You can work with costume, you can work with set design, you can work with lighting. We bring in various cameras into the game engine. So whether you're shooting on an Ari, a Sony Venice, whatever that camera is, we can actually load that in and you can film scenes in the environment with which your actors will then be. And so we can go ahead and hit play here. And uh, I want Andrea, who edited this, to give a little talk through what we're looking at here on the side-by-sides. Yeah, that would be awesome. So I'm excited to share with you guys what we did in terms of previs for Umbrella Academy season two. Um, when we created the previs, we wanted to make sure that it was going to be unique. It wasn't going to be just like having a visual of like, oh, here's what the shots look like. That's it. We wanted to provide accuracy with everything we were doing. Um, so the 3D model you're seeing of Dealey Plaza here is actually a LiDAR scan, which means it has the accurate heights and dimensions of the actual location. Once we had that um, environment into Unity Engine, we started adding characters, animating, spawning cameras. The camera was actually very, very special to us because it was a virtual version of the Ari Alexa 65. Um, it had the same lens package that they were using on set, sensor size, aspect ratio, and it was actually really easy to use. In fact, Everett, Jeff, and Steve all actually stepped into the engine, spawned the cameras, created multiple shots. Um, you don't need to have have this like heavy gamer backgrounds to be able to use it. We wanted to make it accessible to literally anyone. Um, and with each shot that's exported, it comes with camera metadata that then has information from that shot. Um, and that's helpful because it goes to the camera department, editorial, 
Uh, and what you're going to see for episode 202 was actually shot by Everett. Um, and, and it's not too far off from what was shot in real life for the Frankel footage. Um, this was really cool to see like all of it coming together because Everett would come in on like lunch breaks and like random times and be like, hey, I want to like shoot things. And um, we would get maybe from 30 to 100 shots in like an hour session. And it was just easy to just hit record, create different renditions of these scenes. And at some point, we wanted to explore further than just having the shot. We started trying to like uh, dabble in LUTs and like trying to match the blue tones that uh, Umbrella Academy's color palette has for uh, most of their, well, I guess, if not all of the of the scenes. And from there, um, we once we're done creating the shots, we step into editorial. Editorial strings those shots together and they get an idea way ahead of time, way before they even get to set, in terms of what is this gonna look like? Is this story compelling? How can we um, push this forward? What shots are gonna become priority? And also a little fun fact, we ended up adding the Super 8 camera in here as well. So to show like, oh, which shots could be done on the Super 8, which ones would be done on the Alexa 65. Um, and it was really cool to just see this come together. So that's actually an important point. One thing that I want to touch on is that Previs serves almost every single department that there is, from wardrobe to the writer's room. It can become an extension of what's possible. So everything that you're looking at with the Dealey Plaza situation, they didn't necessarily know even what you would have access to. There's a great story about the FBI buildings that you couldn't go towards. Yeah, I'll let, I'll let Jeff share that story. I'll just say this one thing that... Um, just so everyone's aware, I mean, we we're, we went there for a day, but that's all we had. We didn't have weeks of time to sort of sit there. It's a very busy tourist attraction. It's uh, you know also a place of uh, you know memorial. So we were very limited in what we could do there. So having this previs available to us in the scan made it possible for us to actually design the shots. Uh, maybe we'll talk about the FBI. Yeah, Steve makes a good point. Our our plan originally was to be in Dallas for two weeks and to shoot interiors, to shoot exteriors. Uh, but as the uh, uh, demands of production began to uh, make themselves real to us, what we uh, seized on was the Cinecode to teach us how we could divide up what we were shooting in Toronto and in Hamilton. Uh, in Canada, where we filmed the series, and what we absolutely need to get in Dealey Plaza, because we discovered how limited our time there would be, and uh, you'll, you pr hopefully had a seamless experience of all the surrounding events in episode 208, uh, the saving of, Va of uh, Vanya, the uh, Diego's heroic run across Dealey Plaza, uh, the action of Five and Luther behind uh, the grassy knoll at the fence, those were all shot in different places. I mean, look at this shot. And uh, part, of, part of the genius of the Cinecode was uh, us being able to put the camera anywhere in space, including up high where it was almost impossible to be otherwise without a drone, and previs those shots. And that taught us how we could execute that day most efficiently, uh, two days really, Everett, because you also shot a plate unit after we finished uh, uh, shoot, or a LIDAR, right? Yeah, we, uh, we about six months before we got there, uh, Travis Renke and his company Scannable out of Houston went to Dealey Plaza and scanned the entire thing. And we lucked out because right after he left, the whole uh, Dealey Plaza area became under construction. So we're able to capture it before the scaffolding went up. And when we got there, uh, we realized we were in trouble because most of the buildings were completely covered in metal scaffolding and construction cranes. And we knew we had to paint all that out, but luckily I had that data from before. So we're able to replace most of those building facades. And you'll see in, in the video package, the storyboard side by side with the, uh, the previs. Um, of course, everything starts with the script. Uh, Steve had uh, written and conceived the entire season. So part of what we did long before even the show had started shooting for season two was began to break down how we were going to execute the sequence, when we could shoot it. Because, of course, in Canada, uh, you can't shoot exteriors 
requiring good weather in February, for example, or you can't do it outside. And so, um, you know, we would start with the script, with uh, Steve's vision, there would be a tone meeting with the team, and this was even before our director, Amanda Marsalis, uh, started on the show, this is months before. Um, the storyboards come next, we do a first pass of those, and that begins to shape the vision of the sequence as it moves further into the process. And uh, part of what we did that I think turned out to be pretty effective for the team was share those storyboards with the previs and techvis so that um, they could get a, as rich an experience of what the vision and execution of the script was gonna be. Well, Carlo, if I can pass it to you for a second because that LIDAR became incredibly important to you when it came to actually executing shots, right? Oh, absolutely. So really, you know, with the previs, you got the LIDAR and then we'll add assets to it, right? And it just gives us amazing one-to-one -one representation of the world that we're in. So then we can take those assets and kind of move in towards visual effects. And that's why previs and visual effects go hand in hand. So the building that comes down, <laughs> uh, how was that an exterior shot that you guys were able to get? Did we have to recreate that entirely? When the FBI building gets destroyed? Yeah. So that was based off a LIDAR scan. In, in, in real life, it is an FBI building, so you can't blow it up. That would be bad. Um, <laughs> Uh, but we, uh, I, I flew the drone as close as I could get to that building, and every take I'd go a little closer and a little closer and a little closer. <laughs> and to, so somebody peeked out the window and kind of gave me the evil eye. I went, okay, I'll, I'll back off. But uh, yeah, we were trying to shoot the drone stuff at the same time main unit was shooting uh, Diego and, and the other cast members and the extras and the stunt people. So we had the drone going up while they're shooting. So they'd shoot their portion and yell cut, and when they yell cut, I had to land. I wasn't able to get enough footage. So I realized if I flew over the fountains, the little pools, that it was safe. And the AD said, that's fine. So I was able to get way more footage just flying over the fountain while they kept shooting. I didn't have to keep landing and going back up and landing going back up. We just sat up there and hovered for as long as we could and just shot, shot, and shot. And nobody's talked about the hurricane yet. That yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, tornado. A tornado, tornado that tornado. hit Dallas uh, the week before we were supposed to shoot. And so uh, the team on the ground there really did incredible work getting us clear and access uh, enough to shoot that day. But we really had two or three units going full time from sunup to sundown. It was incredible. Yeah, I mean, our, our production team and out of Dallas and the police department were incredibly helpful because they had a huge job. There we go. Can, can I add one thing to what these guys are saying? I, I don't know if everyone's aware out there. I mean, we only add maybe seven or eight backgrounds. So everything you've seen there are, are digital assets of people running. But it was another day when we were there that there were hundreds of visitors. And we used uh, David Castaneda's character, Diego, very early in the day. And we hid all our names of our show so they didn't know what we were. But we kept, every time we moved the camera one way, we'd have to move hundreds of these people to go behind us or this way. They're nicest people in the world who came to visit the site. But it was a challenging day. Um, but, you know, I think without the assets from, you know, being able to do this digital film tree, I can't imagine. I mean, we, we, we shot everything we had planned out one by one by one. And I don't think how we could have done it any other way if we didn't have that, you know, that tool in, in our toolbox to, to shoot and to do, use that sort of software, it wouldn't have been able to be done. Yeah. Yeah, it really taught us what we could uh, shoot and how we could shoot it. For example, there's a, a fabulous scene with uh, five, uh, with Lila and Diego, they're sitting in a car. Uh, it's, it's in the trailer for the second season. And um, five pops into the back seat. And they're staking out the uh, book depository because Diego's trying to figure out how he's going to save JFK and fulfill his destiny that he believes his father is expecting him to. And um, we really wanted to uh, shoot that in uh, Dallas and weren't able to because of our scheduling. And again, that's, you know, part of what we did was use the tool to imagine where we were going to be in space. And we shot that all on a blue screen in um, uh, back in uh, Toronto using plates that Everett shot. 
And um, uh, the, the uh, location that we picked, we didn't know, was right beside the book depository, which is literally the heaviest tourist foot traffic from about 10 o'clock on. So you, never, you won't see this in the show, but every time Everett spun the camera to take a new plate, we had to move about 500 people. So they were walking around like a sundial, just standing out of frame for every plate. And they were incredibly gracious, I have to say. It was, uh, it, Wasn't it, there it was, a great story too about the book depository when you guys walked in and like there was a bunch of Umbrella Academy, like the graphic novels? Yeah, that's true. When, when we first went to Scout, uh, in, which was actually around this time, yeah. uh, because our director of photography, Neville Kidd's daughter, was playing here at South by Southwest, uh, Millie Kidd. Uh, and... Um, uh, we walked into the library, and the, we hadn't identified the name of the show. We were under a code name. I forget. We were, we were Mercury, Mercury, I think, yeah. in the second season. And uh, there in the library were the two issues of uh, Dallas, the graphic novel uh, uh, from the Umbrella Academy. And the librarians explained to us, of course, we couldn't tell them who we were, what a great tool the Dallas graphic novel was to interest uh, kids in the history and the story of the depository and its connection to JFK. That's so cool. Well, Everett, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to kind of talk us through what we're about to see next year with the VFX reel, because there's so much happening in the before and afters, so much that happens with each, with each one of their powers, so much that was happening in the battle scenes. And so if we go ahead and, and cue this up and hit play, uh, I'm going to trust you to kind of walk us through some of what we're seeing here. No, oh, absolutely. Uh, I think one of the big things is we had no motorcade whatsoever. Uh, we had no vehicles. Uh, it was really just our actors and some extras. Uh, this is Battle Dallas. This was uh, really based on Texas Street, right? Or the, where the Texas, where theater, the Texas was. theater is, yeah. Uh, we found a, a street in uh, Hamilton, Ontario that looked very similar uh, to a Dallas location. So we sort of recreated it and we added some buildings in the background. You can see the cityscape is based on Dallas 1963, which was a really fun research project. I mean, Dallas has changed so much since 1963 and what buildings now exist and what, you know, what was made later on. It was incredible to uh, dig deep into that research. Ever, can I just add, this city looked more, this, ta this street looked more like Dallas uh, in 2020 than Dallas did. I mean, we, this is the only place we could find that looked like that. So go ahead, Everett. Yeah, no, it was a, it was a massive achievement. So... You know, again, LIDAR scanning, we, you know, we LIDAR everything, we scan every actor, we scan every vehicle, we scan all the props. We have a huge library of stuff because you never know when you're going to need it. And, and our saying is you can never have too much reference. So my team, myself, we're always taking photographs of, you know, street corners and street signs and little details, because I think that's really, it's the devil in the details that, that makes this stuff work. And again, just to interject here, while we have Luther, and there's so many stories, but like, again, practical, that's an actual creature costume. You said has lasted all three seasons at this point for Luther? That he wears the prosthetic? Yes, that's correct. And the tentacles, can you still, can you share that story? The tentacles in season one were sort of not featured. They were kind of hidden. Uh, and we had to rebuild them for uh, for this season, and we, you know we we always continue to try to outdo ourselves every season. We always amp up the amount of effects and the technical aspects. So this is one of those uh, you know, episodes that we just really went all out. This is a little bit bananas here. I mean, kudos to you for showing the work. And I think it's it's hard for a lot of people to understand necessarily what goes into VFX. I mean, you're building an entire city here. And like you said, the motorcade didn't actually even exist. And so when we're going through layer by layer, Carlo, even what goes on in you, look at you shaking your head over there. <laughs> I mean, as an artist, it's so exciting to see this work because it's world class, you know. Just seeing everything from the details of like an enormous LiDAR scan being implemented in every shot and just the textures and the fluid sims and the, the character rigging of the of the tentacles. I mean, well, it's really amazing. So can I put the onus on you to, to unpack some of that? I don't, how many people here know what a fluid sim is? You know, <laughs> give us pedestrian terms. What's that mean? Okay, so like, um, let's say like the big explosion before we see like the Umbrella Academy titles. 
that's something that's done in Houdini. And it's just a particle sim is so in depth. I mean, if you go into that, you may never come out of it. <laughs> okay, because we're talking hundreds of gigabytes of data uh, that are cached, right? And then you have to render it, and then you got to, you know, embed your passes and go to composite. And it's just, it's a lot of work. And it can be very frustrating at times because you're looking at a computer for, you know, days on end trying to get this one sim out the door. So Everett, we were just watching, it was just an alleyway that could have gone so wrong. How, how did you even begin to build that? Does it start at the scout? Like, how did you find that? What made that the right place? Yeah, no, our production designer, you know, we had to find a street again in Hamilton, Ontario that could cover a lot of our scenes. And it just happened to be an alleyway off to the side. So they built that you know, bottom portion of the building, but the above portion was green screen. So that was, we had to add that in. Um, but yeah, no, it's a tremendous amount of detail and layering and, and uh, you know, paying attention to the details, like I said, is really, really important. Yeah. yeah, and that was the location that we used for the entire season. So, uh, you know, even down to the small details of the diner across the street, we built the actual diner that we shot in into the physical location so that we could connect what we we're seeing out the windows with what was happening on the street. And the, um, uh, the uh, hair salon that Allison works at it was another practical location on that same street, but with a very different vibe. So we're able to get a lot of use out of that particular corner, but we were there for almost eight months and needed a relationship with the community. And, and I might actually, I think, are we going to see Vanya again in this coming up? Yes. Because this was, this is, here's the building of it. I'm going to give it right back to Everett because uh, please, sir. <laughs> yeah, originally the scene was shot and it, different position she was laying down on on her back and it was you know she was in a trance and then when Steve saw the cut he goes no I want a more dynamic pose so I had to take you know Vanya's head from a different scene and put her onto a CG body so we had that dynamic pose and my job is to make everybody crazy and say <laughs> do a difference so but it, it 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 it's amazing how that turned out well but i want i want to stop you there because that's the intentionality that's what i call flossing your teeth with a scene because that mattered you wanted something far more this is someone who in season 1 had just felt completely out of her own family, had no sense of, of kinship to all these magical powers and then to come into them. That's all of our stories, right? Eventually you come into your own, you feel it. And why did that matter that you had the face, but you wanted this pose, this moment, what she was coming into and, and feeling as her own? Yeah, I mean, after a two-year journey, the, the character of Anya needed to find the inner strength uh, that she had as a character. And it was a moment of really not being afraid, not being the wallflower. So the pose initially that we had didn't sort of express that. So we went with a much more, in my mind, a more powerful, forceful, I'm here pose. And it, it turned out to be uh, you know, much better. Um, I just want to add one more thing. So just so it's clear, when we do these pre-vis, uh, sorry, the, the, the tech vis with Digital Film Tree, we put on these goggles and you know, we're actually looking around in the world. I actually almost got sick wearing them after the first five minutes, but it just allows us all those, these, these little details that you guys see, it's because we could plan so perfectly ahead of time. Shots like this, I mean, we could look at what we wanted to do, and then Everett was able to do his magic. And you can see here, like, sort of all those pieces just come together. Um, but it, it's, it's a process of sort of working with all these different teams and, you know, get, having great communication and, and pulling it together at, at the end. Well, because even some of these assets, you know, these aren't, these aren't things that we build entirely in the game engine. There are thankfully pre-existing assets. Go ahead, Andrea. Yeah, I wanted to mention, um, well, no one wants to be in a VR headset for more than eight hours a day creating shots. So we actually did create a version of it for desktop. Um, Hopefully one day I can share with you guys what we did, but I do want to mention that, I don't know, Carla, do you have anything else to mention? Um, yeah, I mean, I would say that uh, what's really amazing is that as soon as you put on the headset and uh, you start going around the universe or the LiDAR scan, immediately the creative juices start flowing. I mean, I remember seeing it. We put on the headset and it's like, we can't put a camera there. There's a parking meter in the way. We can't put a camera there. There's a tree in the way. You know, so immediately, as soon as you go on to set, you have much more precision 
but it's also heightened the medium too, because now when you're on set, you could add a medium shot that you'll, you'll have the previs uh, cut there on set and you could watch it and you could be like, oh, I actually, we don't have a wide shot here. We could get more emotion from the scene if we just get this wide shot, you know? But, but I think the evolution of it, and tell me if you guys agree, is that someone like myself as a show and a producer is I, I don't necessarily have to go to the location anymore. Right. I can sit with the director, or the cinematographer, we can plan out ahead of time me never, never ever getting on a plane and going somewhere saying, this great location, these are the angles we all love, let's do it. And I think that is a, a very powerful tool going forward because the amount of time and effort that's spent scouting, going places, it's, it's a lot. And this just could, this takes away all that sort of extra elements that we'd have to do and streamline the, the process is what we're all trying to do at the end of the day. Yeah, we're, we're not allowed to say anything more about season three, but what I can say is a pandemic happened. And so sure. we're working remotely. We have, uh, for example, because we were shooting in Canada, we had directors who had to quarantine for 14 days as they were coming across the border. So how do you use that time efficiently and well, and one of the ways was utilizing the Cinecode and utilizing the TechViz process to begin to prep their episodic work. So it would begin with the script and breaking that down, a tone meeting with Steve to talk about the vision. We would uh, do storyboards as a first step, but then from there we would immediately start zeroing in on the sequences that were impossible to previs any other way, whether it would be the, the stunt, guy, uh, stunt previs or um, you know, visual effects previs. And the beauty of the system is it, pu it pushes the data so fast and it's so nimble that we could go into a scene, uh, our uh, production designer could provide us with a SketchUp or a, a LiDAR of a set if the set existed. We could ask uh, Andrea and Carlo to uh, populate the scene with actors. We could assign powers to them. And then the directors of photography, Neville Kidd and, and Craig Wibleski, we could sit and look at the screen and, and Everett and Philip could be on with us and talk about where the camera was going to go. We could pick a lens. We could decide which camera was going to be utilized. That's an incredibly beneficial thing to a production that even at our ambitious size is moving incredibly quickly, has limited amounts of time. Jeff, can I just add that at that point in production, we weren't allowed to have more than four actors on the set at a time. There were so many rules for shooting. I'm sure you've all heard a lot about COVID shooting, but it would have been nearly impossible without this tool. And, you know, at, we, we were the one, one of the very few shows we're proud of that never shut down once. We kept shooting very safely throughout all of COVID. Thank you. Um, and a lot of that was because we could plan ahead and really understand what we were doing. And that was, that was critical. And because we, Toronto was, um, you know, behind America in terms of getting the vaccine. So they, they stayed in a very heightened state for most of our shoot. We did. Yeah, we there did. There is a huge amount of credit that you guys are just going to have to say thank you after I uh, applaud you for this, but you are a bloody well-organized show. I mean, I, I, I don't even... Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Carlo, you can speak better to how many shots we alone at Digital Film Tree have. Um, Rami Katrib, CEO of Digital Film Tree, sitting up here filming me. Thank you, sir. Um, he likes to say co opetition We believe in that. Um, for a lot of folks, they probably don't know that VFX houses are just overwhelmed right now. There is an absolute boon happening in this industry where there are, there are houses that will not even take an entire sequence and just say we're willing to take this one little part of it. And so Everett, just you told a great story about there's no closed doors because you guys really do communicate thoroughly, efficiently, respectfully. The, the I'm on every single email. Can we CineSync it for? Can we, you know, and it just it makes all of us better. I mean, Carlo, you were even talking about how when you got certain shots over that had been started at another house, you learned so much from what you got to see and how we were able to expand. So tell me about how you did navigate a pandemic and how you do have those communication structures. And then, you know, we can come back to what Digital Film Tree gets to enjoy, but you guys have to, you had to build this beast. <laughs> Absolutely. That's you, Everett. Yeah. <laughs> We're looking at you, F. You know, uh, 
I was thinking of, there's a, we're talking about how there's no locked doors between the departments and I call it gracious spying because I used to go to the other departments and walk in and snoop around and I would go, hey, what is that giant concept art of a robot walking down the street? I, I know nothing about this. And they go, oh, you didn't know? There's a giant robot walking down the street now. So well, I didn't hear about this. Where did that come from? Oh, well, the director wanted to try this. And it's like, well, well okay, let's, let's dig into this a little deeper. Same thing with costumes or makeup. I love working with them. And I love hanging out and seeing what they're doing. But I also learn a lot of things that I might have missed or there was a meeting that happened that we weren't all included in. So keeping everyone in the loop is really important for all of us. But by the way, that was a hypothetical. There's no giant robots <laughs> walking down the street. In our, in it our was show. hypothetical. Wait, is no, there that's, a not, that's not a leak. Uh, that was just an example. Um, but no, I have to say, like Everett's, um, you know, Everett's team and how well he got, has a good workflow with um, digital film tree is very important because I don't, as a, as a producer, and, and Jeff and I, we. We see it after he's had the hundred calls, Jeff, with with the team over there, digital we do. Entry, and we just say, no, that's not right, and this is that. But they've done, you know, call after call, so it's it's a lot of building to get even to the point where they come to us and say, what do you think? And then we just assume, well, change these three things, and it's easy. Ever never gives away. That's really really hard, and that it'll take a lot of work to do it. But we we always get it done. Steve always tells our production designer, you can just build that set, right? Yeah, I do that a lot. Yeah, you well, can do all that, sure. I mean, we do. We have to give shout outs to Philip Hoffman. We have to give shout outs to Dylan Shadinsky, our head of VFX, and Avital Shalev, our director of creative services. Just, you know, Carlo, if you can kind of speak to the amount of shots, you know, there are, you know, fun fact, we're not hiding anything. Almost every show in existence has beauty fixes now. And so some of those beauty fixes can take like 15 minutes. But then you have ginormous shots that can what take like days, if not a week, to do. Yeah, and we, I mean, we have a very talented VFX team. So, you know, if we have a whole scene where we need to clean something up or make sure something looks a certain way, then we're in total communication, you know. But also, I would say that, like, uh, you know, uh, a show like this is really a global effort. So, something like, you know, Number Five's Blink, you know, we work with Spin on that, and then we'll get the script and open it up. And then we'll go through it, which is, by the way, a, a, you know, masterful <laughs> nuke work. Um, and then our editorial team will go through and make sure that continuity matches. Because that blink has to look right, you know. And I think we nailed it on the first go. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and I do kind of want to go into to the powers here. So there's a huge difference between Klaus and sending a zombie army after people to the rumor, to the blink. All of these, you know... Everett, how do you stage these things? And how do you get the continuity to, to match, not just shot to shot, but season to season? Well, I remember uh, first season, we did a camera test with, with Aiden, who plays number five. And he was talking to me about like the scientific sort of realities of, the, of him blinking and trying to explain to him that like, well, is there a mathematical formula that how I blink and how does it work? So I said, you know what's kind of cool is if using your body motion it really it helps, and he's really great at it. So when he blinks, what he's doing on set is like jumping in the air or jumping forward, and that momentum drives the blinks. And that's always something that you know I love when actors bring that extra level of detail. Uh, but they all do. All they're, all our cast is so great about really going for it when it comes to their powers, and I think they trust us now so much. Uh, but I always get questions occasionally, like, well, "Where do my tentacles come from?" Steve? <laughs> yeah, I, I make up some kind of reason in the moment. Uh, but no, they, it is amazing how our actors were definitely involved. And, in, you know, I had conceptually thought of the powers. Obviously, I had the graphic novel as a, as a source guide. But, you know, it, it, it can't, wouldn't translate. It, it couldn't photocopy from uh, graphic novel to TV. So there's a lot of playing around with how we could make these things work. So our actors really had a lot of thoughts about them. And, you know, I would bring Jeff and Everett into the discussion and we would say, okay, well, how do we bring that to life? And, and we did it. And, and, you know, we're hopefully you'll see in season three, everything continues to evolve, but it was, uh, it really was a group effort to sort of make those things happen. 
Well, I'd kind of love to know, especially for, for Steve and Jeff, what was maybe something that was completely unexpected across any of the seasons that you just hadn't originally imagined it that way, but got to come to life in post? Uh, one, one thing I will say is, um, you know, the actor, the, the, the casting process and the arrival of those actors begins the journey of them inhabiting the part. And they become Steve's partner, our partner, in the process of creating the character. And as a, as a producer, as a director, you never know 100%, you know, ask somebody if they know how to ride a horse. There are varying degrees of that. And the same thing is true of actors' ability to do stunt work and to fight and how they understand holding their body in the air, for example, if they uh, need to do that. So, you know, the, the beauty of it was discovering the, the strengths of, uh, of the cast and finding out, for example, that Emmy uh, was a terrific fighter. I mean, day one, she she was kicking ass with everybody else, and maybe that comes from her theater training or her fight training. And then the second thing that happens is you you need a stunt double for that person. And the facility and the ability of that person to do what's being asked also feeds into the powers. So, you know, for example, uh, with, um, you know, with uh, uh, Justin's tentacles, that's that doesn't require a stunt double, but for Diego and for the other cast members who do a lot of their own action, or for uh, um, you know, for number five when he's blinking, um, all those things require the actor to seamlessly integrate into what the vision of the power is. So we do spend a lot of time talking about that with the cast so that they understand and that they can communicate to the directors and the DPs. And if, if I could just add that, most of our stunt work, most of our cable pulls, when you see the actors hanging in the air, it's them. They really want to do it of their own. They want to be as realistic as possible. That's why we can shoot our fights in a certain way where we're quite close because we don't have to cheat that much. I mean, of course, it's in the bounds of safety, but we, we encourage them to, you know, to, 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 to want to be involved. And they took upon themselves to all of them train on their own time with our, our stunt trainer. and. Literally every one of them, including Aiden, uh, who started as a little boy, who's now, believe it or not, he's 18, um, also learned to fight. So it Incredible. was great. Yeah. Well, and so speaking of actors, the it, one of the interesting stories uh, ever shared with us is I, it never would have occurred to me that extras leave after an X amount period of time. And so... To, to have what you would hope, maybe like 50, 100 people for some of these crowd shots, if you don't get to that, they go away <laughs> and it's left to VFX. So how does that, uh, do you push for that to have them there at the beginning and get that shot? Well, especially in season two, it was, it was snowing out in this back field. We had, I think, 50, 100 extras and by lunch we had 30 and then, you know, halfway through the day or after that we had maybe 20 left over i mean it was like people just get tired you know they don't want to hang out and we also had a weather event of historic proportions in season two while we were filming the finale out at uh, sissy's uh, farmhouse so uh the it was about a five-day sequence the first two days it was green and the skies were blue and clear, it was warm, we were heading into November, and overnight we got eight inches of snow. And so Steve nimbly adjusted the storytelling to allow us to embrace what we could never uh, totally resolve and get rid of. There was a quick meeting of all the minds with Everett and, and Steve and uh, Jeremy Webb, our director, and uh, Craig Robleski, who was shooting that last episode. But the amount of plate work and scrambling and backfilling that had to be done in order to prepare for the transition of the sequence from green to uh, snowy and cold. And on that particular day, uh, because we had established the characters in summer wardrobe, we had to have everyone out in their same matching costumes in zero degree weather. So you can only put so much spandex and, and hot shots and warm clothing underneath all of those summer suits and, and, ha and the masks and the helmets. And, you know, they had to charge up and down and, and build the, the basis onto which 
you then ultimately graft a, a you know, a, a thousand uh, commission army. <laughs> but how are you missing the, the worst part of it? How you not told the story? I, I may have blanked out. I may have completely blanked out of, of, of anything For bad. any of you filmmakers, it's not, it wasn't just a snow event. It, we were totally screwed. We shot in one direction for a few days to get all the coverage that way. So everything that way had no snow and then it snowed and we had to shoot all the coverage this way for three days. And none of it matched. It couldn't match because we couldn't get the snow to melt. We tried, and there was nothing to do. So wait, how did you try to melt the snow? I gotta hear we, this. We have Canadians who do, who are snow experts, who who can add it. They can melt it. They can get rid of it. But it was just too much in a huge field. And this is the finale in, in season two. So I was really trying to explain to to Netflix and say, guys, we we we, we can't. We got to do this again. We can't use it. They're like, it's not so bad. <laughs> so what we did is we cut a reel together going shooting it as it would be and we showed them a reel where like our actors would be running full speed one way with no with grass and they cut and then they'd be in three feet of snow running the other way then back to grass and back to snow um but ultimately it was a it was a vfx fix ever did to to save us to make it all look like we, we had to decide whether it was going to be snow or green and ultimately we went with snow <laughs> right ever yeah it was a combination like one direction was green, and, the, and if it did have snow in it, I had to remove the snow and put green in. Mm -hmm. And the other direction, we, we called it the snow cone. It was an area around the barn where Harlan was that had snow, so we were able to blend the snow back into the scenes as needed. Yeah. So uh, I want to throw this to Andrea, uh, Andrea because this is kind of where we start, right? But what has been across the two seasons, but what you can talk about has been your favorite uh, experience to work on so far with this show? Um, I guess if you're saying experience, I think I like how much it's progressed. Uh, obviously, I can't dive into season three, but I will say that um, because you guys are so organized, even Jeff, like your vision is so clear with your direction and everything that um, you do, even when there's when we're barely in pre-production phases where um, the script is barely at its first draft, like no one really knows so much about what's going on. Um, a lot of a lot more departments are getting involved with the previs. It's not only a cinematography and a director thing. Um, also, like the stunts are getting involved. Um, at this point, it's a mixture of previs, tech viz, and pretty much everything. And it's just been really fun to see how how much that has progressed and how more people are open to seeing how it's helpful because it is the future and it's not going away. Well, um, can you break down the difference yeah. between, because I don't think we actually touched on that, the right. difference between, say, so pre-viz encompasses all of it, but what's the difference between story viz and tech viz and fight viz and safety viz? Safety viz? <laughs> so I feel like this is one of those things where it'll go on like a Webster dictionary at some point and then have like 20 different definitions. Um, to start with previs is it's basically like pre-visualizing the story. So I see that as like blocking shots out, um, overall encompassing all, the entire production. And tech viz is more technical. So like things like figuring out what kind of camera equipment you're going to use, um, the lenses that are being used, what can we make in addition? Um, is, are some of these shots going to be handheld? So tech viz uh, is, I guess, more so camera based, but also just anything that might, I guess, influence those kinds of things or change the way things are shot. And as far as story viz, I always see that as more of like a storyboarding thing. Um, and just really figuring out like where the actors are standing, what the composition is going to look like, and less focusing on like, okay, so like what camera are we using today? Um, it's just basically building out the layout. And for safety viz, um, safety viz was actually something that we also considered when we were doing um, season three with just like spacing and like figuring out like what kind of lenses we could use to cheat things, especially because there's a lot going on in terms of like, oh, uh, six feet distancing. And everyone was pretty much new to just like, um, I guess, adjusting to the pandemic. So there were some things like that that we had worked on and just figuring that out. So it's definitely more so kind of a mixture of doing behind the scenes work, but also incorporating the story into it. But Jeff, that was particularly of interest to you, the tech viz, because of how particular spacing needed to be and just what you could swap in and out. 
Well, and, I, and I, especially for the integration of the storyboards and the tech viz, that was as soon as I saw and the other directors saw the power of that and our ability to integrate the two and then to be able to incorporate, uh, you know, a wireframe of an effect, for example, and then we'd be able to show those to Steve and get notes from him and turn that whole uh, process around to get a second draft working with Andre and with Carlo. Um, the, extremely efficient and powerful. Um, it, spacing for sure, but also to the kind of tech viz aspect of well, what lens do we want to put on? So for example, we, um, you know, Lexus 65 is our principal uh, unit, but we also have the LF deployed. We use a mini. Um, we, uh, we, uh, we have the Zeiss uh, uh, Super Primes as our spherical lens, but we also uh, had uh, the Hawk anamorphics. And so uh, playing with which uh, lens package we would go with, uh, deciding whether we'd need a specialized piece of equipment, for example, um, being able to get low below the floor. And the beauty of the tech viz is even though you have the set in SketchUp or AutoCAD, you can fly the camera anywhere. So we could, we could experiment and Craig and I might be sitting there and say, well, let's, if we want to get the camera 10 feet above the set, don't tell the production designer yet, yeah. but if we wanted to get the camera 10 feet above the set, what would we have to take away in order to shoot, you know, with the 24? Because we, we, you know, we have a certain style sheet that we were trying to fit to. And so, you know, being able to make all those decisions beforehand and, you know, for example, um, often the set would be super realistic in the, in the AutoCAD or the LiDAR, so we could, choose which crane might be able to uh, arm all the way in and then rise up high enough in order to make a shot in one instead of having to make it with two cameras or um, you know which dolly we could pick to slide between the back wall and the pillars in order to not have to take a wall off uh, to pop a wall to shoot a shot and those seem like very you know granular details but they're hugely important trying to manage a schedule uh, directorially and for the director's team to decide which shots to make first. So then that, you know, augurs to which actors have to start the day and who has to be in makeup first. So the more of those decisions you can make during the previs and the tech viz, um, the, the more efficient you can be uh, on set. Yeah, it's almost impossible now to imagine going back the other way. I mean, it is so efficient for us as production. I mean, we, we will continue to use it. Uh, we're looking forward to as, you know, every every time we meet up with Digital Film Tree, they, they've got to the next level. They're refining it and refining it, but it truly is the future. It will it will save us money and time, and the efficiency is 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 of course money and money is the business to save money for the for the shoots and for the networks and the studios so it, it is it, it's a tool that we will continue to use yeah definitely m money well well spent for us and and even to the point where because we had sets that were uh, lidar there were uh, you know there are a few elements that lived um, into the downstream post-production process. So, so Jamie and Jason and the, the visual effects team and editorial team uh, back in LA could keep wireframes of some backgrounds that we had played around with in the tech viz um, for, the, you know, for the finale sequence, which you can't talk about. But. Yeah, I'll just add that Jamie and Jason Nice are, we said are, are post producers, but they're a big part of how this works too. So uh, kudos to you guys for keeping a, a pipeline going and everything else. We really appreciate it. You guys don't get enough attention for that. So thank you. Um, well, let's take it home into finishing. So everything that we pre -vis after it goes into VFX, Stuff still changes before it actually hits air. You go in. Never. That's a scurrilous <laughs> rumor. I, don't... I heard a rumor. No, no, no. So. Um, so, but tell me, once you actually then get into color, how do these shots change? What changes, period? Well, it depends who you're asking. I mean, uh, I'll, I'll let Everett ask, answer that first part of it. What you do in color, it's really just sort of. You're, it, w the goal is when you get to color uh, or DI is to have all your VFX shots final. Um, but it adds, it's my first opportunity to see them truly in either 4K or 
on the $90,000 monitor that we have so it can look perfect. And sometimes they just don't look what they look like when we did it in Avid. So oftentimes we have to sort of amend them. And uh, Everett's mostly flexible about mending uh, shots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we call it final pending DI review. So the vendors know, oh, well, we're close, but Steve has every right to reject something once we're in the DI session. And that happens, you know, occasionally, not a lot, but it does happen. And then we'll go back and tweak, and then sometimes we'll catch other things in the mix, because then you have the sound and dialogue and music, and this, it's all about the story and the rhythm of things. If something doesn't work, I totally back them up, and I'll go back and tweak it. Yeah, but and I've seen 20 iterations of a shot before we even get to DI, so there's something really that stands out. But good communication between us and Everett and the, the Nice brothers is, is how we sort of avoid big surprises. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, you, you never really have a chance, I mean, until, until Steve, until we get into the DI process and seeing images fully rendered, you've never really seen the moment to moment life of the character, the performance integrated with the effects and all the other visuals. And that often informs you again, you know, if a shot needs to be adjusted or added. And it, the, the visual effects houses deliver us um, shots with handles. So it's very often that we might want to roll a frame left or right, start something a little sooner. Um, you know, maybe punch in on something a little bit. So uh, it, it's definitely, we're still telling the story at that stage and that's why things sometimes change. So again, I know we can't say anything, dive into any parts of season three, but I think for us, at least what was just so cool and, you know, an upside to people having to quarantine and whatnot is there's just so many more people got to experience the game engine kind of the feeling coming out of that, getting to share this tool with your team. Uh, I, I guess I'm asking for a little bit of praise here. How did they, <laughs> how did they like well, it? I, I Are they can, addicted to I, it now? I can say one thing, the actors, you know, we would show the actors before we'd shoot a sequence, whatever material was available. So sometimes it's just a storyboard, but when we had the tech viz and they could see it and say, wow, I'm gonna look like that. Um, I, especially for people who may not have worked in this kind of environment before. So Cassie David, for example, the first time we did a stunts and visual effects sequence uh, with her, uh, but also, you know, Elliot Page, who's a, a, a veteran and, and been doing it for years. He, seeing it brought to life in that way before you have to do it is incredibly informative. Yeah, and then when they see the final product and they've seen, I haven't seen everything yet, but when they see the other side of it, when we're through with it, it sort of, it still blows their minds. Like they're like, how did we go from here to here? So it's always an exciting thing for us to say, look what you guys did. So call Digital Film Tree and say, <laughs> how do I learn how to use this? Where do I get it from? Can I do right. one of my own? And uh, are you hiring? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it is funny because we have heard it used in so many ways in the editorial room walking around on set, there's even an opportunity to take like screenshots of it now and, and move some of the people in your iPad so that you can take a screenshot, print it off and put it up in Video Village if a shot changed during lunch. But it is a confidence builder to know what you're going to look like at the end of all of this, like how you're gonna get the shot. We have, you know, we have another panel tomorrow on Ted Lasaru and they're dealing with massive soccer shoots where they have to know that they got the angle because they don't get that field back. And so similarly, it, it like you said, what could cost $10,000 in a day can cost much less in pre -vis and you know that you actually got the shot, so. That's right. Well, oh no, Jeff. Oh, no, agree, agree. <laughs> well, lady, gentlemen, I think that's it. Do you think we did justice to bringing the Umbrella Academy to life? I think we did. I, I, I think we What did. do you guys think? <laughs> Yay. All right, thank you so much. And June 22nd, make sure June you're 22nd. there. June 22nd. All right. All right, guys, that's a wrap. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.